ITCTA is actually a good home for people who are trying to practice culturally relevant, uh, rubber hits the road, real treatment with multi-traumatized people, uh, but from an, from an empirical basis. So ITCTA is what's called a, uh, different names for it, but empirically validated. It, uh, it, is a, it is actually a treatment that has been shown to be effective in treatment outcome studies. Uh, again, you know, take that for what it's worth. Uh, but th this means that it's often a, sort of the natural home for people who, uh, who are providing really helpful treatment out there but don't have a name for what they're doing and, and can't justify what they're doing in terms of some kind of validated treatment. So let's just uh, meander our way through. You should all either have a hardbound a paper copy of the ITCTA treatment manual or you should have a thumb drive version. Does anyone not have that? Not that I could do anything about it, but I'm just vaguely curious. Uh, I slow down for traffic accidents too. Okay, so um, the manual is also downloadable from ATC, the website you see on the bottom of the page there, attcusc.edu. No, I didn't say it right, attc.usc.edu. Cheryl says we like acronyms, actually. I'm easily confused, so acronyms I usually start saying RSVP, the VDRL treatment, the, you know, whatever it might be. So let's just sort of uh, talk about this stuff. We actually have already uh, discussed the characteristics of complex trauma. Usually it starts very early, it happens a lot. It usually is done by humans as opposed to events. So some people have said that they can find complex trauma outcomes in disaster exposure and other things, but generally uh, that wouldn't be the case. Generally, uh, the literature speaks fairly clearly to the fact that events caused by humans with intentionality hurts other humans much more than if the event happened randomly. So as I like to say to medical students, if you, tr if you fall down a flight of stairs and you hit stairs one, five, seven, and nine with your head, it's going to matter whether you tripped or you were pushed. Okay? So although the event was the same, the, the impact is quite different. You know, a very interesting example that I, I can't get into it, but just to mention it, is Hurricane Katrina, because Katrina was seen as a natural disaster uh, but I was sent to Katrina maybe 15 times over the next five years, 10 years. Um, it hasn't changed much as far as I can tell even now. But, you know, the community groups there don't want it to be called a natural disaster. In fact, at a, at a community meeting, I was bawled out by uh, someone from, from one of the residential groups around there because they saw it instead as the evidence of a white government overlooking the concerns of lower-income African-American people. And there's also a long tradition in... Uh, the Lower Ninth Ward and other areas uh, of uh, the Army Corps of Engineers treating them badly in terms of the development of, of the walls that protected uh, the community from water and the way that they were constructed, et cetera. Uh, and then probably our president's reaction at the time was not conducive to interracial relations in America. And so his reaction and the slowness of his reaction caused a huge event, amount of antipathy. Now, a lot of people believe that Hurricane Katrina actually has a higher PTSD rate associated with it than a lot of other traumas. Do you see why? Because it's, it's transitioned into a belief that this, was, this act occurred because of negligence, or even if you talk to some people on the ground right now in the Lower Ninth Ward, willful intents to hurt African American people. If, you, if that's your model, and I, I wouldn't actually completely disagree with that model based on what I've seen, uh, then you're going to see this as an interpersonal event. This was a relational event, and that's probably why it's higher there. By the way, it's, it's still heartbreaking to go, to go into New Orleans because um, you've got white against black. You've got people who have in, homeowner's insurance versus people who have uh, FEMA support, each side thinking the other side is getting a good deal. Um, some people have said that the incipient racial dynamics of New Orleans has just been brought into that limelight so that what you see now is what the result was there. But it is pretty dramatic uh, if you talk to people who are actually struggling with these things. Uh, so uh, relational in most cases, as we talked about earlier, both acts of commission like victimization, hate crimes, uh, uh, childhood abuse, and then acts of omission like child neglect, both psychological and physical, as well as disattuned caretakers. Now, you know, we're used to blaming maltreating parents. A disattuned caretaker is probably someone who would, if they could, they would attend more to their kid, but they're interfered with by psychosis or substance abuse or sex stuff uh, in terms of, of the sex trafficking or whatever. They're homeless, they're whatever, so they don't actually have either the a free attention to provide a good uh, interaction with kids or uh, they are the victim of 
they're, they've experienced uh, you know, generations of maltreatment, which has impacted the entire family system so that uh, sometimes the, the, the care that those kids are getting is not very good because the parents are impacted as well. So in ITCTA, for example, when we look at disattuned parents and psychologically neglectful parents, we don't see them as perpetrators. Typically, we see them as people who are also suffering, who are also clients in a way, and we, and we approach it in that domain. You've seen all the stuff here about effects I talked about earlier, except that we would more formally now, since we're getting into a little bit more into the, to the specifics of conflicts from outcomes, self-capacity disturbance, which just means there's three things that early neglect and disattunement and early, very early maltreatment are going to generally do to you. Actually, there are more than three things, but we've just defined them over the last decade or two as self-capacity problems, and there's three of those. Those are uh, your ability to maintain an internal sense of who you are that's relatively coherent, that has boundaries, that understands that you have the entitlement to good treatment, that means that you can call on your own internal states when you're in a distressing state. Now, you know, I'm also a student of Buddhist psychology, and in Buddhist psychology, the notion of accessing a self is the notion of a delusion, that there is no self and that that actually gets us in trouble. And I'm very sympathetic to that. The Western model of self is very compartmentalized relative to other models of self or non-self throughout the world. But no matter where you go, from the Dalai Lama to uh, your last uh, inner city kid you saw in therapy, everybody on some level constellates a sense of who they are so that they can call on themselves when they interact with the outside world. If you come up to me and you say, John, you're a really bad speaker, if that really mattered to me, I might be crushed. But if I could access an internal model in myself which says, eh, I've done better, I've done worse, but I'm on average a little above average, then when you tell me that I suck, uh, I'll probably affect, it'll affect me, especially given my childhood history, would, if there would be press for me to be affected that way. But what will happen is that I can access a central notion of a general ballpark of the topography of my experience. I basically by now know who I am. So if you tell me, a stranger tell me that I'm really stupid or whatever, I'm going to go, okay, could be true, but I don't think it's true. So whatever that is, that comparison notion is very helpful. With, with ITCTA, by the way, we do do a fair amount of work on these identity self-access, self-reference issues, but we don't treat it in the psychodynamic or psychoanalytic ways. We treat it more like how can the therapist respond to the kid in a way that reinfor reinforces the child's dignity and self-efficacy throughout treatment so that treatment becomes a model for you to reference your own experience rather than trying to please the therapist or the dominant culture. So we have a lot of work actually on improving access to self, and I'll mention a little of it later, but mostly it has to do with, you know, if you really looked at the early attachment literature and really looked at what seems to be the central mechanism of how people develop a benign sense of who they are, it's the inferences they made on how they were treated. Because this stuff is incorporated way before there's language. These are implicit memory encoding, right? So if you, think, if you grew up thinking you're a pretty cool kid, it's because people treated you well. And you inferred your wonderfulness based on how positively you're treated. A kid who isn't loved is going to assume that they're unlovable. They're going to infer that based on their unloved treatment. So now we have kids walking around. A lot of that knowledge is implicit. It's not verbally mediated. You can say, Esmeralda, I can't believe you think that because you're not stupid, you're not ugly, you're gorgeous, and you're brilliant. Is Esmeralda going to go, thanks, I never thought about that. That changes everything. I feel completely differently now. <laughs> the problem is that, first of all, we're speaking to an area of Esmeralda that doesn't speak the language we're speaking because it's encoded at nonverbal levels. Also, once you've developed a model of who you are, it's highly resistant to change because everything that comes in gets evaluated. So she goes, oh, you feel sorry for me, or you're lying to me, or you're trying to get something from me. What she doesn't think is that she's not stupid and ugly. So these, a very important part then of ITCTA is that in many ways, the treatment we do, it's as much as important what we do as what we say. And you know, if you say empowering, supportive, caring things, but you act in a way that cuts them off when they try to go onto their own stuff, or reinterprets their problems as something different, or gets punitive with them or whatever, even though you might be saying I'm on your side and, and, and you're here to, to find your own voice in your own way, if I'm kind of bullying you into traditional models of, of be a good kid and do what I say, it's not going to work very well. So uh, what we like to say is that the, the self-interventions are not 
programmatic. They're not about do this, do that, do this, although we do things like avoid interpretations, avoid a lot of lecturing and psychoeducation and stuff. We do try to avoid the things that would kind of make the kid feel like they were being talked down to. What we will do, though, is try to get that kid to figure out. We like to say, work with the kid to have them give themselves their own psychoeducation. Because it turns out we know a lot more than what we think we know. And if the therapist can have them talk about safe sex or, or the problems with uh, gang activity or whatever, if they can actually process it, they can tell themselves the stuff we want to tell them. That's going to be much more empowering and much more likely to produce increased sense of self than if I just, thank you, Kiria, than if I just give them a lecture. Okay, so we have various notions here, but you're going to see that most of it has to do with if there's a, you know, if you've got a video of a therapist working with a kid in ITCTA and the kid says, I don't want to talk about that and you suck, why should I talk to you? You're an asshole. This is an exquisite choice point for the therapist. <laughs> do you go quiet and withhold attention, which is punitive, of course? Do you say something a little snotty? Do you get defensive? Or, you know, and I'm not saying any of us can do this even on our best days necessarily, but or is the goal actually to say, this kid is sharing with me his or her evaluation of what he or she needs at this moment and his or her hypervigilance and worry about whether I can provide those things, but it's calling up in me early relational schema associated with my own difficulties in childhood, which are causing me to have what cognitive people call a source attribution error and think that they're actually treating me in a horrible way and that this enrages me when all that really happened was a 14-year-old kid said stuff to you. Right? So if we can kind of recontextualize that stuff and we can do that from a mindfulness perspective or from, from a number of psychological perspectives where we can understand that we're being triggered but also understand what actually happened when that kid said, you suck, was that was awesome. I mean, you know, if you want them to be good little boys and girls, it's not awesome. If you want them to grow, if you want them to feel that they're entitled to their opinion, if you want them to, to start to reify and develop the first fledgling notions of entitlement, this is cool. So that's self-work in this way. It's not analyzing the transference. It's working with the, what Pema Chodron calls the smelly stuff. The real stuff, what's really going on, what's, how's it activating you, and what's it about with, with your client, and how can you reinterpret what's happening from a way that, that validates a sense of self. But, you know, a lot of us work cross-culturally, and especially when you work with people from Southeast Asia, for example, uh, and other environments, they may not have a sense of self in the classic way you understand it. So you have to be careful that you don't get stuck in cultural models of of what self is, but every culture believes that self-confidence is good, that you should have some sense of self-efficacy, that you should learn some version of self-reliance. Not the self-reliance of the 16-year-old young man stuck in prostitution who's self-reliant because the world has treated him really badly, because that's a reflexive, defensive, uh, isolating, uh, avoidant, dismissive style which will hold him in good stead in some ways but will never make him happy because he really needs love and connection. But what we mean by self-reliance here is the understanding of self in a relatively benign way so that when the toxins of a dysfunctional system hit you, you don't believe everything that you hear, that you instead have your own competing model that allows you to get to a better place. That's not conveyed linguistically as far as I can tell. That's conveyed by how you actually work with your client. So the next time you want to set your client straight, give them an interpretation, lecture them, etc., Welcome to the clinical experience. We all do that. But you might see it as a tension reduction behavior that you're engaging in because you feel helpless or invalidated or not very smart or whatever. So you're going to do this thing. Or maybe you feel challenged. Who does this kid think they are? You might think you're all big, liberal, fancy psychotherapists, culturally informed. And then some kid goes into your face and says something and you sound like your father. <coughs> That's because your father is very important in hurting you or helping you. So, you know, it's, it's going to be there. Our, from the model that I do, what's called a compassion-based supervision, or, or I've developed a model for that, uh, the idea is when you have, or consultation, when you have uh, a reaction like you want to set this kid straight, who the hell does this kid think they are? How many of you have had that experience? Who the hell does this, I know everybody's looking at you, but raise your hand, it's okay. I mean, it, you all have. I mean, you all have probably, maybe two of you haven't. Uh, that's just called being alive. The issue isn't that that stuff arises, the issue is your relationship to what arises. What happens next? What do you do with it? You know, and I like to think of it as what we call feedback from the system. Feedback about what the client views themselves and me like and what they're asking and what they're trying out 
and feedback to me about my uncooked seeds, as the guy long ago said, my unresolved issues that can be pulled up by a provocative, obstreperous youth. Because many of these 14, 15, 16-year-old kids who are raised on the streets, they're going to give you grief. I worked for a while a lot with young people involved in prostitution. I was just run through the every kind of cheese grater you can imagine on a daily regular basis. Everything from, uh, you know, analyses that I was trying to have sex with them to I was the epitome of everything that was wrong with the dominant white culture. I mean, all those things are going to come up, but that's not evidence of anybody being bad. That's called hanging out with a hurt person. And in many cases, their cry has great validity. But the danger is when we interpret it in a way that it gets us activated. So, uh, You'll notice in, the, in Cheryl's and my manuals and books, we usually have a fairly large section on therapists managing their own, quote, countertransference. And it's because these kids, are, if they're healthy, they're going to be a problem. If they're getting better, they're going to be a problem. Worry about the ones who don't give you grief, on average. Because they're in the acquiescence mode, and that's actually harder to get through because they're trying to please you, which most people are, but they're trying to please you, so whatever you try to get them to do, they do it to try to please you, which doesn't help their self-efficacy. They just get better at learning how to please you. And, and so, in fact, that's actually a harder presentation in many cases. Uh, and uh, affect regulation is a big deal in ITCTA. Uh, this refers to the relative ability everybody in this room has to calm themselves down when they get activated into emotionally distressing states. Uh, probably there's a bunch of different affect regulations so that every emotional state has a different set of skills. How do you calm yourself down when you're pissed off? How do you calm yourself down when you feel abandoned? How do you calm yourself down when you're sad? But that class of behaviors is both biological, your, your HPA axis, your uh, neuropeptide Y co-release, your parasympathetic nervous system activation. Sorry, I said those things to you. Uh, <laughs> But then also, how were you raised when you were a little kid? Was the environment, did it support you in figuring out how to respond? Uh, did you get to trial and error, learn how to soothe yourself through small, surmountable obstacles? Not big things like that you were being abused, but maybe you weren't fed the second you were hungry, you had a diaper rash, you threw your fuzzy white thing on the floor, and no one picked it up for six or seven minutes at a time. Those kinds of experiences are going to teach you what? Frustration tolerance and the ability to slowly develop a more develop affect regulation repertoire, but if what happened to you is you're being uh, uh, penetrated at three, you don't have the option to develop trial and error algorithms for affect regulation. What you have to learn is affect avoidance. You have to go into the emergency state and learn how not to be overwhelmed by all that painful in incoming sensory and psychological data. So what unfortunately happens is that the loved, cared for child is going to get better and better at affect regulation the hurt kid is going to get better and better at affect avoidance. Most of us are a mixture of both of those things, but the people that have a huge amount of positivity in their early life experiences are going to be much more affect regulation focused. And the ones of us in this room and in the world who didn't have that environment, had more hurtful environments, are going to be, we're going to trend towards avoidance, whether it's drugs or sex or aggression or cutting on ourselves or pulling our hair or watching too many movies or masturbating or shopping or eating or, you know, all those things that none of you are engaged in, but, but a lot of your colleagues are <laughs> and most of your clients are. So affect regulation is a big deal. And by the way, um, if there are any hardcore CBT people in the room, uh, I'm with you. I'm your brother too. But I have to say that the direction I think that the modern empirically validated treatment approaches are going is away a little bit from exposure-based models and towards affect regulation training because we're discovering that a lot of kids and adults who need to process trauma are not ready to process trauma because exposure to traumatic material overwhelms their capacities and they use avoidance to survive therapy or survive life and they never get a chance to actually process. If we can give them greater skills to help them learn how to regulate their emotional states, then they can after a while be able to encounter exposure with a bigger skill set. Because asking a kid with no affect regulation to have prolonged exposure to being raped in an alley at 12 is cruel and inhuman punishment because you're asking them to go way beyond their therapeutic window, way beyond what they can tolerate, and that's going to hurt them on some little way at least. So that's why 
uh, the self-trauma model, which I've been involved in for a while, as well as its current incarnation in ITCTA, talks about titrated exposure, which is that you ask people to process the level that their affect regulation can handle, but no more, and that you give them lots of permission to terminate exposure when they don't like it, or to titrate it down when it's too much. These are not the messages of classic exposure therapy. But this, so this is more of a, quote, permissive model. I don't like permissive because it sounds like we're giving permission, like we're the cool ones and they're receiving permission. But it is the notion of saying to the client, you get to decide how much exposure you can tolerate. If it's upsetting, stop. Now my colleagues at NFO, lots of folks, give me personal specific mean grief around these things, saying that that's a bad idea. But I don't think it is. I mean, if you couldn't really process things, and I asked you to, and I made you, and then you did process what you didn't want to process, are you going to come back? As I like to say to residents, you can't help them if they don't come back. Right? Or they're going to come back, but they're going to be all shut down because they're going to be trying to survive the fact that you apparently are someone who wants them to talk about stuff they're not ready to do. But what would happen if I said to you, if I gave you a little bit of psychoeducation, not a lot because we, we have this little saying to try to control our urge to set people to tell people stuff, we say, it's just a little phrase, don't set people straight. This is something we use all the time. It also has a big gender orientation, sexual orientation implicit message in there. But forget that for a second. It's just, don't set people straight. Don't tell them what to do, because that stuff won't work. Okay. So the idea here is that uh, I don't make you do exposure therapy, but if I say to you, here's a little bit of psychoed about how Processing is better than avoidance. Avoidance is perfectly understandable given where you find yourself. There's nothing wrong with it. And what you're doing is the best you can do to survive at this moment. But we do know, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong because you are doing the best you can, but we know that to the extent to which you avoid talking about stuff, it's going to stay there. And the extent to which you can talk about what you can handle, it might get better. Don't guarantee anything ever. If that's true, then what I would like you to do is when I ask you to talk about painful things, I want you to talk about it as much as you can for as long as you can, but if it gets too much, you stop it. And by the way, if you don't stop it, I might stop it if I think you're freaking out. So this is called a permissive approach, but that's an authoritarian statement, permissive approach. But it's the idea of saying it's up to the client. So we even talk about, just to show how weird this gets, if you ask the client to talk about something and they don't want to talk about it, or they talk about it for a second and they shut down, we don't call that resistance, we call that self-titration. Do you hear the difference? And are you going to trust me more when I, first of all, my experience, and I said this to Ed Nafoe actually, my experience is if you give people permission to process and stop, they'll process longer because they know they can stop. So they won't be worried you're going to make them do something that they don't want to do. They'll do it to the extent that they can. And by the way, when they do it, they won't be giving in to yet another oppressor, making them something, do something they don't want to do. They'll be doing something for their own reasons, which is that their own belief that what they've been told about how processing is helpful will probably be helpful. I'm writing a whole book on this now. It's going very badly, so don't ask me about it. <laughs> it's a popular press book, and it's called The Pain Paradox. And The Pain Paradox basically is for Western human beings, we have been trained that when pain comes up, avoid it. And actually, the best thing you can probably do is when pain comes up, to the extent you can, embrace it. It's so counter to our social messages. If you watch TV, you don't hear that message, right? You hear the message, you suck, therefore, buy this car, buy this deodorant, take this drug. So it's about avoidance. But actually, engaging is probably the way to go. But asking someone with a history of being on the streets and prior to then being victimized or neglected all those years, Asking them to engage before they're ready to engage, engage more than they should, is problematic. This is a big deal. I've actually literally lost friends in the field by taking this position because it's not the classic position on exposure. So you guys figure out what you think about it. But basically what it's saying is exposure is a good idea, but it has to be on their terms and it has to be in a non-authoritarian way that allows them to process. If they want to move on, let them move on. And then relatedness is, is the third disturbance, which is just basically, if you're a kid who's been hurt a lot, you're going to start making assumptions about other people, that they're dangerous, they're to be groomed or acquiesced to, or they're to be avoided, or they're to be hung on to. Right? So if you're a kid who had a mother or a father who wasn't psychologically available, and whenever 
Uh, the kid tried to connect with the parent. The parent uh, spaced out or zoned out or, or was mean to them or whatever. Pretty soon the child's learning that proximity seeking, which is a normal human dynamic, is being punished. Therefore, if you are, if you, what that kid's learning in there, what we call relational schema, is people, if you care about people, they will reject you. They will abandon you. They will leave you and go off and do other things. There's actually two attachment styles that can arise from that. One is the preoccupied style, which a lot of adolescents have, which is then you become clingy. If people are going to leave, then you hang on to them really tight. The problem is that will make them go away, right? If you hang on to someone, they'll, they'll go, what's this about? And they'll run away. The other one, but that one, by the way, we use a little metaphor sometimes with young adults at least, uh, which is the preoccupied attachment style is like going to a first date with a moving van. So it's that notion of, so if you're that other person who wants to get a moving van, you know, you just want to hang out with them. And suddenly they're trying to recruit you for a lifelong relationship. The other style is dismissive avoidant, which we see both styles a lot with traumatized kids, but dismissive avoidant would be kids who are keeping everybody a distance, not letting anyone in. For the old timers in the room, it's the I am a rock, I am an island approach, right? It's saying, if an island feels no pain, I'm not going to be there. If, if being close to people hurts, then I won't be close to people. Technically, we call that disengaging the attachment system because it's pretty pervasive. What's the good news? If you actually disengage from other people, you won't be so hurt by them. So they are right about that. The problem is, you know, an author once said, hell is other people. The problem is that's only half the equation. Heaven is other people, too. So the problem for the disengagers, the dismissive avoiders, is they never get a chance to connect. So they don't get a chance to engage in one of the biggest things for humans, which is to love and be loved. So uh, how do you, now what I just said, how do we put that into a CBT framework? How do we put that in an empirically validated framework? Well, actually, I think you can. We have to use different language. You have to use Baldwin's terminology, like relational schema. So rather than say we're dealing with someone's abandonment issues, da da da, you say, you know, we're processing their relational schema associated with early attachment dysregulation. It sounds better, but the bottom line issues are everybody needs to be loved. Some people's style is to push away people because they, could also, they know that they could be hurt by those people, but there's a massive downside. So with that 15-year-old kid who doesn't want to let you in, let's say he's a he, that kid, he needs you really, really badly, and his entire attachment capacity is directed towards keeping you away. It's very frustrating for you, and that's when you'll start pathologizing him. But he's just doing the best he can, in terms of what he's figuring out. So actually, Cheryl's in our new book, which just finished this week on the ITCT for the little ones, uh, has a lot about how do you work with that dismissive, avoidant kid to, to recruit them into therapy when actually therapy represents exactly what they're trying to avoid, right? Intimate, deep connection with an attachment figure where you have to trust them. I mean, forget it. And then the dysfunctional uh, strategies we talked about before, these are avoidance capacities, uh, things like dissociation, which is a defensive alteration in awareness. So you zone out, you space out, you make the world unreal, you don't feel inside of yourself, you float above your body, you space out, you zone out. At the heavier duty stuff, maybe you don't remember things most people would remember. And at the highest level, we're not sure exactly whether it arises from the same mechanisms. But at the highest level, maybe there's even different people inside of you that have different functions, have different names, et cetera. Uh, we've done, if you go to my website, you'll see we've done a lot of research trying to take apart dissociation. It's probably not a thing. It's a bunch of things. But nevertheless, the bottom line focus for a lot of dissociation is to bring pain down to a level that is tolerable by, dis by decreasing your access to the pain. What's the good news about that? It works. So if you walk around zoned out, you won't feel as much pain. What's the bad news? It doesn't work. Because although you may have a decreased awareness of your experience, most research suggests you're still having the experience. Not only that, but by avoiding, you're not processing. So you may get through the next 15 minutes, but there may be an infinite number of 15 minutes ahead of you, because whatever it is that you're avoiding is still there. That's the pain paradox again that you're going to have to engage it at some point. So in working with a dissociated youth, which is not at all an uncommon scenario, you know, you want to pathologize them. You go crazy about the fact they're not focusing on you on some level. But that's just they're leading with their survivor edge. This is what they do. So you have to find a way to get in there. And probably what's going to be helpful is if you don't see them as pathological or trying to do something to you, they've just unfortunately found a solution that has lots of problems built into it. Substance abuse, 
I, I do a whole day on substance abuse with kids. Now I'm going to just do four seconds. Uh, basically, there's probably two motives for substance abuse, self-medication, and uh, moving into a positive state that negates a negative state. So you've probably heard the self-medication hypothesis. That's the most common one, which is you numb yourself out with drugs as a way to avoid painful internal experience. There's no question that's a big dynamic, very true. The other one is, though, that a lot of kids, if you ask a kid, why do you use drugs, they don't usually say, so I can go numb. Some of them do, but they usually say, I want to get high. So we say, hi, we slap into, there go those hedonistic youth again, trying to get high, you know, with a tinge of jealousy, right? <laughs> but in fact, uh, at least I would say, if you actually take apart the desire to get high for people who have a lot of trauma, they're not getting high for its own sake. They're getting high because when they get high, they don't feel bad. You hear the difference? So it's not just, I want to feel good. It's that when I feel really good, I won't feel bad. Try this with your next survivor who's using substances. In a non-punitive, non-judgmental way, ask them what they get out of getting high. And they're first going to tell you how great it feels and stuff. But, you know, I would... I would guess that in many cases when you ask them, they're eventually going to say that when they really are high, nothing bothers them anymore. And that's the beginning of what we're talking about here. That nothing bothers them, their history, their world, the neighborhood they live in, the trauma that they've experienced. So ITCTA, again, it has its own module. If you feel free to download that. I think it's on your uh, 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 thumb drives. And I think they, it looks like they're handing out the manual here too. Is an attempt to re reanalyze the treatment, the uh, substance abuse treatment modality in a way that's sensitive to multi-traumatized youth. Uh, and you'll see that almost nothing that you would see in an AA model or in some of the medicalized versions of AA will actually be there. Not because AA doesn't help lots of people, but it doesn't help lots of people too. That's the secret that they're keeping from you. Not AA, but the universe is keeping from you. That AA works for people who respond to AA. And kids don't do so well in it, probably. That seems to be a feeling that some of us have. So I would much rather that you uh, looked at a module like Seeking Safety or something. One of the models that actually trying to teach uh, substance addicted, traumatized people how to deal with stuff from a perspective that doesn't involve pathologizing or saying that substance abuse is a bad thing, but instead saying it's a thing that makes some sense. Uh, now, that isn't good, right? So when Lisa Najovitz or myself or someone says, it makes perfect sense that you use drugs. Believe me, I do a lot of public speaking. And when I speak to substance abuse program audiences, probably one a month, every two months maybe, I get grief. Because, it, you know, the, we all have our own sacred whatevers. But a lot of what this model is, is is not authoritarian, it's not judgmental, and it's coming from the perspective, not that you take responsibility for your substance abuse per se. We're big into that, aren't we, in this culture? We don't take responsibility for our own maltreatment of other people, but we want them to take responsibility, right? Probably the bigger issue is to see why is this behavior an adaptive capacity? And what's the good news about it? Why does it work? Why do you have to deal with this person's substance abuse? Why is it so effective? And then you've got to figure, do they hate it at the same time they like it? Luckily, they do. I'm giving away the book. You can look at it later. But, so you can align with a part of them that doesn't like the fact that they sold their mother's TV set and she won't talk to them anymore, or that they've got hepatitis C, or that they've got HIV, or that they're on the streets, or when, you know, whatever it might be. People stuck in prostitution especially, well, maybe especially, but certainly... Uh, older adolescents stuck in prostitution have to use substances just to be able to do prostitution because it's a horrible thing. It's one of the worst things you could expose a human to. The happy hooker notion of the 70s, it did not exist then and it doesn't exist now. Prostitution is an evil, I don't believe in evil, but it's an extremely bad thing. So the, when you see kids that are out there on the street, whether they call it survivor sex or they identify it as prostitution, they have to do all kinds of stuff to not be present when that's going on. So you go up to them, you know, this is a person who's holding their entire history at bay with, with cocaine or more typically with methamphetamine or something, and you say to them, Ramon, just say no to drugs. <laughs> I mean, the problem is that you're speaking another language. It makes no sense to them. It's a stupid idea. What I'm going to want to do is figure out why they need to use drugs, and I have some hints. Then I'm going to see if I can reduce the pain that drives them to the state 
and I might work to see if I can increase their affect regulation capacity so that they have other ways of dealing with the distress. Actually, you know why people don't get better from substance abuse very much, in my view? It's because you can't help that. You can't cure substance abuse. What you can do, though, is remove the need for people to engage in it. But if you've ever had a client who was substance-free for four years and then their relationship breaks up and they start drinking or drugging again, what do you learn by that experience? It never, it, you didn't cure them, it just wasn't necessary. We want to do is see if we can decrease your need to do it and increase your capacity to handle whatever is going on with you. And then tension reduction behavior is such a big part of self-trauma model in ITCTA. We use the initials, of course. TRB, so you'll hear TRB, you've probably heard it. TRB is a self-trauma model initially notion of external activities engaged in as a way to reduce painful internal states. So anything you do on the outside to deal with pain internally, whether it's cutting on yourself or masturbating or punching someone out, and to the extent that any of those things are a way to break or separate or block or neutralize painful internal states, we call those TRBs. And that's where kids are getting in trouble a lot. I actually feel a little bit bad about this, that the ITCTA is being used more in the world as a treatment for the, quote, acting out adolescent, because that's just a portion of all traumatized kids. It may not even be the majority of traumatized kids. Um, I, I think ITCTA has more to offer than that, but I do understand why people want it, because the acting out kids are the kids that are making trouble for everybody, so they want to try to help them. Forget for a minute that the acting out kid is probably doing better than the regressed, withdrawn, depressed, dissociated, shut down kid. Do you have, have you ever like gone out to dinner with a family and the kids are really good? Like I worry so bad when that happens. It's like the kid's sitting there all polite and stuff. May I leave the table? What's up with that? I mean, you know, and why are they not expressing their own opinions? And why are they not disagreeing with your parents? You know that they hate their parents. It's part of the job description. And they're sitting there. You know, those are the worrisome kids. Maybe they're just a lucky kid that they don't need to do that stuff. But kids are not. Kids are like a bunch of Labrador Retrievers without good training. So they should be that way, right? So, when you, so actually, we worry more about the ones that aren't the squeaky wheel. And unfortunately, ITCT is used more for the squeaks. So just to uh, run through this. Now, does the first one scare some of you off? Assessment-based. If you're not a clinical psychologist who likes to give psychological tests, this might make you think that what we do is we give lots of tests to people and then employ psychologists to interpret them and then, and then on the basis of that we do things. Well, that is actually something you can do, but assessment here just means some way to check in in a systematized, focused way. We're going to talk about something called the Assessment to Treatment Flowchart for Adolescents. And this afternoon, Cheryl's going to take you through filling out an an, a an ATF. So what they are are a structured way to evaluate between 18 and 20 different components of complex trauma. By the way, after you do it a while, you get very good at it and you can do it quite quickly. Uh, on a probably two to three month basis, if you're seeing for people longer periods of time, to evaluate them to figure out what seems to be the issues that they need help for, and just as importantly, what issues do they not need help for, and then only use the cafeteria approach that we're promulgating, the components model, to apply the treatments that are helpful for that kid. So if your kid doesn't have flashbacks or hyperarousal uh, or dissociative responses tied to those things, they may need more different kinds of treatment. They need less exposure therapy, more affect regulation training. Or maybe they have PTSD, but mostly what they have are post-traumatic cognitive distortions. That's going to require a different treatment than post-traumatic intrusive experience, although there is some overlap. So the idea here is that everybody will get a different treatment. This, by the way, made it very hard for us to publish the treatment outcome study because uh, what some of the journals said was uh, we were not, in fact, showing the effects of a treatment because everybody got different treatment in the things. So we had 100 and something kids. We'll show you a slide at the end. Uh, there was over a 40% improvement, which is huge, especially since we didn't eliminate anyone and these kids came from straight from the inner city into the, into the clinic. But what we heard was, you're testing a treatment philosophy, not a model. So do you see the problem? Person one's getting a lot of this, but nothing of that. Person two's getting a lot of that, but nothing of this. Uh, we were able to finally convince people that that's a, as they say in software, that's not a bug, that's a feature. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the idea here is uh, actually, uh, that's good that nobody gets the same treatment. 
So there is that variability there. Um, so assessment-based could involve psychological tests, and that probably is the most uh, efficient way to do it, but, it, but I gotta be honest with you, probably 20% of all ITCTA users out there use psychological tests. Uh, focus beyond post-traumatic stress. You know, for many of these kids, post-traumatic stress disorder is the least of their problems. They've got a lot of relational attachment, affect regulation problems, they're in trouble with the law, they're substance abusing, they're dissociated, they're doing all kinds of stuff. PTSD in terms of flashbacks and hyperarousal at least uh, are part of their problems, but they probably, if, they were to, if you were to ask them to hier hierarchically categorize what they needed help with the most, probably relationships would be number one. They might say different ways of saying it, uh, et cetera. So, we do obviously focus on post-traumatic stress, but it's only a part of what we focus on. I would again draw your attention to the cross-cultural analyses of the relative rates of PTSD across the world. It's actually mostly obviously prevalent in the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and uh, parts of Europe. When you look at Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and other places, there's something a little bit like PTSD, but it's not really the same. This tells us two things. First of all, since we're seeing people from all these cultures, that's a problem. The second thing is it's a really a wake-up call that there's no such thing as PTSD, right? PTSD is itself a culture-bound disorder, and so it's going to be more or less prevalent with different groups and even within subcultures within America. So if you say the sin qua non of whether your client needs help or not is whether they have PTSD, I can understand that, but that's a very limited model. Could you imagine, if you think about some of your hurt clients, that if you could now liposuction out all their PTSD symptoms? <laughs> now think of one of your clients. Would they be all better? They really wouldn't be. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to work on those PTSD symptoms, but it's probably not enough. Centrality of the therapeutic relationship opens a huge can of worms. Actually, I've never known where that expression came from. And why would you want to can worms? I mean, this is the first time I even thought about that. And would they even be alive after you open the can? I imagine they're all squirming, but they'd probably be like dead worms. This opens a can of dead worms. The dead worm is, is the therapeutic relationship an active ingredient in therapy or not? And if you look at some of the hardcore CBT short-term therapy approaches, they would say the therapeutic relationship is not necessary for recovery. It's helpful in the sense that it keeps the person in the relationship so you can do CBT on them. But in and of itself, it is not a critical aspect. The other approach, though, looks at the entire uh, treatment outcome literature you know, the meta-analyses, the studies of studies of the treatment outcome literature, and generally the big studies show that there's two factors of Im that produce improvement in humans in therapy. One is called the general factor, and the other one's called the specific factor. The specific factor is which therapy you use, which techniques you use, et cetera. The general factor is the quality of the therapeutic relationship, the match between the therapist and the client, extent to which the therapist is compassionate and caring and empathic. Guess what? The, the, the specific factor does predict outcome, but it's dwarfed by the general factor. So if I have to be honest with you, uh, models like ITCT, TFCBT, all those things, all those initials, they can be helpful because trauma is a pretty specific problem. Uh, but the, if I have to make a referral to either a trauma therapist who, with not very good interpersonal skills or someone who's really good at the general factor but doesn't have this workshop, I'll send to the general factor person because that person is going to probably and overall be able to help this person more because of the caring, connected qualities they have and the fact they've been trained to form meaningful relationships. Now, I went through uh, like 9 or 10 or 11 years of analysis, so I'm a little biased that way. Although my writing has been sort of anti-analysis, I went underwent analysis. You know, my analyst, of course, said, you know, John, I read one of your books. Why are you here? It took like four years to answer that question. But part of the thing about psychoanalysis, especially modern psychoanalysis, is very attachment-oriented, and it's about the general factor. So actually, you know, when we get all empirically validated, well, what are your treatment outcome data for psychoanalysis? We're barking a little bit up the wrong tree. So part of what, because we don't have good ways to measure general factor treatment effects, we look more at specific factor things like P flashbacks, et cetera. We don't really know so much about that. And yet, the treatment outcome literature as a whole says that the quality of the relationship you have with your client is probably the biggest thing that's going to determine the outcome. That's why, I know you've already heard it, maybe you've already heard it too much, that ITCTA is all about honoring the dignity of the person, appreciating cross-cultural differences, encouraging self-efficacy, 
allowing the client to, to argue with the therapist or be difficult with the therapist, working with the client to figure out how they can problem solve the difficulties that their life have produced, not of their own making, and trying to non-blame them and not pathologize them. Those are all te technical aspects of ITCTA, but really, what are they? They're, they're a version of the general factor. I mean, if I asked you, who would you like to see in therapy tomorrow? Would you like to see someone who, who would give you manualized treatment, or would you like to sit down with someone who's just interested in you and wants to know what's up and really wants to hear about how you approach things and provides an environment where you can figure out what you need to do next and maybe give some technical assistance, but mostly is helping you figure out where you're at rather than you trying to dance to their music. You know, it's probably you'd rather be in that domain, and that's, that's the general factor, and that's what ITCTA is interested in. Customization, uh, let's just say that it happens. So aspects of ITCTA, we attend to the gender of the person. Men and women vary not only in which traumas they're more likely to have experienced, but they also gender, vary in terms of their relative power in different cultures. They also vary in terms of gender uh, or sex role uh, training that they've had around. Uh, women are, are trained to be more expressive and related and connected. Men are more trained to be instrumental and to act on things, to fix things. Uh, women can express more, men can express less. Uh, and the two genders in the stereotypic present presentation don't really understand each other very well. They both have positive qualities, but clearly um, what this will mean when we're doing work in this area is that you can't treat your woman client the same way you treat your man client. They're just, they're so different. And ironically, what is our therapy? Is there therapy generally a model for treating women or men? Women. Traditionally, almost all psychotherapy clients have been women. I mean, the vast majority, from Freud's day on. So, of course, the model that developed, whether it developed it well or not, is another question, is a model to attend to, to, to the interests of women. So try to apply a treatment for women to a 17-year-old acting out pissed off gang member who's a guy. If he doesn't kill you, he just won't come back. So now, do you, does that mean you reify their own gender roles and just say things that their sex roles can accept? No, but you have, that's part of the diagnosis component, isn't it? Which is, what can this guy tolerate? I actually experienced, I don't know if the men in the room will disagree, usually the women agree with this statement, uh, that women are actually better at handling trauma and do better in trauma therapy than men because we men have to try to fix things rather than reflect. We have a harder time expressing because that we're not generally uh, socialized to express much. You know, fixing itself is a, is a good solution if something needs to be fixed, but fixing can also be avoidance, can't it? You know, uh, let's say you have a heterosexual couple struggling with a miscarriage. The woman wants to talk to the man, talk about her pain, suffer, cry, etc. The guy loves the woman, so while he's holding her and she's sobbing about her miscarriage, you know, he understands what's going on with her, but in the back of his head he's going, I am so screwed. Because really, he's already done with this. She's been crying for 20 minutes, and he's trying to find his way out the door. So he's still hanging on to her, holding her hand, and, you know, and he means that. But the problem is he's been trained, when you have a problem, fix it. Don't whine. Take care of business. So then he finally squeaks out, you know, honey, I've read that the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis of pregnant women is compromised by high levels of stress. Maybe you should quit your job. Okay, now he thinks he's being very helpful. She feels he's what? You're all, all the women are giving me that look, yes. So that's, that's a lack of appreciation. That's not allowing the woman to be where she actually is. And it's probably not that helpful. But those are both gender appropriate roles, right? So a lot of what we try to do is figure out, my doctoral dissertation was on this actually, the, the gender of the person, the reaction to different kinds of stimuli, and then how we interpret it from a social perspective. And there, there were quite big differences. Uh, age is a big one here, uh, and by the way, this is not chronological age, but a lot of adolescents actually are processing it at the level of a nine-year-old or something, or at the level of a 24-year-old. And so you'll see in the ITCTA manual that we talk a lot of, well, some about, many, that you want to craft your intervention so that it doesn't feel dumbed down to the psychologically sophisticated 16-year-old or doesn't sound smartened up to the 16-year-old who's actually operating at nine. Cause the, the one that you say stuff they don't understand, they'll check out. The one who feels they're being talked down to will think you're just part of the same old system that's been devaluing them and underestimating them that's, that's basically infantilizing them when they can actually do more. You know, of course, what's interesting is that very sophisticated 16-year-old is just a kid, too. 
but nevertheless, they may be processing in some ways at a different kind of level. We don't recommend chronological age to tell you very much other than the broad parameters of how you should be talking, but the specifics are going to vary tremendously. A lot of nodding in the audience, so you get that. Culture, there's just, uh, in anthropological terms, there are things called idioms of distress. Idiom of distress is, is the anthropological way of talking about the fact that different cultures have different experiences of what trauma or problems are, and that they express their problems differently in whatever way is consistent with that culture. So Atakes is much more consistent with certain Hispanic cultures than it is for uh, Midwest American white Anglo cultures. So Atake makes more sense in Puerto Rico than it does in Kansas. Okay. What this means though is because there's so many cultures and subcultures in America that we can't really assume that there's some homogeneity or some communication between the therapist culture and the client's culture. So we have to spend some time trying to make cultural adaptations. And then the last one, there are more, but the last one we talk about now is distress tolerance, which basically has to do with this affect regulation thing. And what this basically means is that kids who come from very invalidating attachment dysregulated early environments probably have some problem, problems with regulating their emotional states. If you ask them to talk about more than they can talk about, they're going to be overwhelmed. So again, we call that titrated exposure. And you'll see this especially in the affect regulation and trauma processing chapters of ITCTA, the notion that you've got to spend some time figuring out what they can tolerate and then don't make them talk about more than they're ready to talk about. And even, and this is harder, it may even be that the client is going beyond their therapeutic window. They're talking beyond what they should be talking because they're so avoidant and dissociated that they, they try to muscle through things they shouldn't even be trying to talk about, or they're so worried about the therapist's authority value that they think that because the therapist asked for it, they have to give it because it doesn't matter whether it hurts them or not, it's what the therapist wants. So sometimes what we actually have to do is that we have to slow down the process with the client rather than the client trying to slow down their own process. We even have a name for it in trauma work. It was developed actually in working with sexual abuse survivors. It's called flooded disclosure. This is people who tell you, way too, have you seen this way too much too soon? And those people usually get traumatized by their own output. So how can we find a way to slow that down, respectfully allow them to just talk about what they can talk about? Uh, ITCT has a lot of affect regulation and behavioral control. Behavior control doesn't mean me controlling your behavior. It means you controlling your behavior. And actually, the psychological literature doesn't say control is that great of an idea anyway. But what it really means here is just as the kid empowered to develop enough skills so that they don't find themselves doing stuff that they don't want to do. So that they, they're in control of the buttons and the levers of their own experience to some extent. Uh, by the way, a lot of really pissed off, disenfranchised kids who don't want therapy have no problem with ITCTA components that are around skills. So we have a module called Trigger Identification and Intervention. Uh, for therapists, it's called Trigger Management. It's a, it's a module. Kids generally love that because it's teaching them how to know when they're being triggered, how to keep from being triggered, how to do something other than what they normally do when they have been triggered. And that has very clear meaning in their relationships, at school, in their third strike, in whatever issue they might be up against at that time. We did titrated exposure. Non-directive cognitive interventions. This is interesting. So when you were in graduate school, you were taught that it's all about judgments. It's all about women or gay men. It's all about all these pejorative notions about what's acceptable and not acceptable. And it's a shaming, highly guilt-inducing word. This is very interesting stuff. Didn't you wince when I said slut? Slut is a word that we use to catch. You know, if a woman or a gay man has too much sex, we call it being a slut. If a man has that much sex and he uses a condom, we call it success. If a heterosexual man does it, it's success. If a gay man or a woman does it, it's being a slut. I've noticed, by the way, that heterosexual young men are now calling each other sluts. I, I think that's a step forward. It seems kind of <laughs> a step backwards, but I kind of like it all. These the equal opportunity disrespect, you know. But these models that we have about ourselves come from the toxic social environments we are in. There may be ways for people to develop psychoeducation within themselves. That's why we say, I think I said it before, work with the client to see if they can give themselves psychoeducation. So what you're doing is you're trying to figure out what they know, what they think might be true, do they have any other hypotheses. And then what you'll often find is, okay, you know that a condom would be a good idea, but you don't use a condom. 
And by the way, you're not saying this in a judgmental way. This is where you cash in on the quality of the therapeutic relationship. You know that a condom is a good idea and you don't use it. That's from like motivational interviewing, right? It's saying you know what the answer is. It just doesn't work for you. It's not I'm going to try to talk you out of your stupid reason for not using a condom. It's I'm going to try to understand why, given that you know what a condom can do for you, the downsides of condoms must be pretty big if you're not doing it anyway. Let's work through that, and then let's actually take apart each piece and see how much validity it has. Not for me ultimately giving you a lecture about safe sex, but instead for you to try to figure that stuff out. That also, by the way, indirectly reinforces that self component again about you figuring out stuff rather than someone else figuring it out for you. The only area that we actually will say more about in psychoeducation than other areas would be trauma prevalence. Sometimes you just have to let people know that trauma is common and resources, where they can go, what they can do. Generally, you can't get kids out of prostitution very easily. You can't get people out of drugs very easily. You can't get people out of gangs very easily. For those three things, we often will refer to other resources for them as well as us working with them. So in LA and in many environments, there are places where young women and young men to, can go to, to be with peers who've been caught in prostitution, where they can talk about things that the therapist could not realistically ever talk to them about. There are gang programs with former gang members who work with gang members now to see if they can extricate themselves from the gang process. We've actually talked about te uh, uh, therapeutic exposure, titrated exposure. This just means we ask people to remember things in safety and not have them activate more emotional distress than they can handle at any given moment. So uh, this is called working within the therapeutic window. And you'll see that in the ITCTA materials, there's something called written homework about my trauma, which is we also have people write about their trauma at home because there's an independent literature beyond the exposure literature showing that if you can journal about your distress, that generally helps you. And it turns out that that may be due to a number of different psychological mechanisms. So we actually asked the kid not only to talk about stuff in the session, but to write about stuff at home. But, however, when you read the manual, you're gonna, if you read the manual, you're going to see that it says not everybody should do the homework, right? If someone's pretty close to being overwhelmed by everything, then you don't want to do the homework because they probably overwhelm themselves later. So this is something you do when they're ready for it. So that identity stuff we talked about here is, now you're seeing the technical word that we use in ITCTA in the self-trauma model. We call it other directedness. So other directedness means that very early on in life you learn that it, what you thought didn't really matter, it's what powerful other people thought. So you become hypervigilant and externally referenced very early in life. Reality is what other people think. What you think doesn't matter if you've been traumatized. Not only that, but if you did turn inward, what would you find in there as a hurt little kid? You'd find pain and rage and suffering and distress. So uh, we would suggest that childhood trauma, especially complex trauma and attachment dysregulation, forces the child to be externally referenced. So what you think matters, what I think doesn't matter. But this means you can have your feelings hurt, you can be devastated, it means you can be talked into things, it means that you can invalidate yourself because everybody else knows more than you do, etc. So we try to, to teach internal referencing is the name. So the reverse of other directed is internal referencing, just meaning that you become more able to, if you think of the examples I've given already today, you get more able to figure out what you want, what you need, and less uh, defaulting to what other people think is important is most helpful. You cannot teach people that in words. You can only show them repeatedly that that's true. So if a client starts screaming at me, I'm usually, unless I get scared or I get too triggered, I'm probably going to think a good thing's happening. That's quite a reframe, isn't it? Because we don't normally like that. I was, I was working in a private practice at USC and I was borrowing someone else's office and they had buttery leather sofas and all that stuff. It wasn't like my office, that's for darn sure. I'm sitting in this fancy buttery leather office with my easily triggered 17-year-old uh, sexual abuse survivor who throws an entire cup of scalding coffee into my face. Now you would probably say, oh my poor epidermis. What I'm saying is, oh my God, the buttery leather. And sure enough, it was an issue for years after that. She basically destroyed furniture. But it was still a good thing. Now, I'd rather she didn't throw coffee, and we tried to get her to not do that anymore. But the desire to express with me the depth of her concern, that was excellent. So we teach affect regulation. We're going to have to break in a few minutes, but we teach this. So we teach relaxation training. We do a version of it mostly here called breath training, and you'll see a protocol in the manual. Uh, Randy Semple and I have developed a model for burn victims 
It's called mindfulness-based breath training. You can download it from my general website. Uh, it's actually even helpful for people that have like 60% full thickness burns across their body who are on a ventilator or on, well, ventilator sometimes, but mostly they still can't really talk too much, et cetera. So if it works with them, it can work with other people too, but it's teaching people how to calm down by breathing in a certain way and by monitoring their experience of breathing. So we're not only slowing them down, we're teaching them a very mild version of mindfulness about being mindful of your own breath. Sometimes burn victims don't do that very well because they've got respiratory damage, their lungs have been burned as well, so it can be problematic, but, but um, we find it is very helpful for them. In fact, we just finished a little, a little grant on that, and actually exposure wasn't nearly as helpful as mindfulness-based breathing, so our new grant will focus much more on that. Uh, so breath training, visualization, imagining yourself floating in, a, in an inner tube in a lake and stuff. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? We don't generally recommend it. Why? Any guess? It can be trauma-related. can be trauma-related, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. And maybe it's not such a good memory. What if you say, though, where would you be happy? What if you were on a lake, da-da-da-da-da-da, floating in your little inner tube? There goes Bambi, waving your little ears at you. Okay, so what if you come up with theirs? I mean, you, all, everything you guys are saying, Trump, got to worry about whether they're going, it's a trauma-related thing. Is it your idea, not theirs? A lot of people don't know what a lake would be like. But there's another problem, is that actually imagery work is a little bit dissociative and avoidant because it's taking you away from your experience. Mindfulness, mindful breathing is all staying where you are. If you go away to a lake, that may not be so good for you. So we do imagery sometimes, but we generally don't recommend it. And the other big one if you work with really traumatized kids in really dangerous environments, is you don't want them to go away. You don't want to model for them not being attuned to current environment because that may be where danger is. So if you say, next time you feel all upset, imagine yourself floating in a lake. You know, they shoot you while you're doing that. Um, we do something called emotion identification discrimination, just teaching kids how to be more aware of what their emotions are. By the way, we don't tell them ever what their emotions are. You're so tempted to do that. Tommy, you seem so angry to me. Actually, Tommy may be having very complicated feelings. And if Tommy doesn't really know what his emotional states are, which is very common for complex trauma kids, uh, if we tell them what they're feeling and they're not, that's a problem. Plus, it goes again away from what? That internal referencing we want to teach. We want them to figure out what their experience are. So I'm just warning you, if you do look at that module, you're going to find out that we never tell the client what they're feeling. We do something called emotional detective work, which is where the client tries to figure out what their feelings are based on what they know about their heart rate, their breathing, the thoughts that are going through their head, any imagery, the clenching of their feet, any memories that are coming up. And then they could say, you know, I, th I think I'm angry. That would be excellent. But even then, we counsel the therapist not to be attached to the outcome. So if they say you're angry, you don't go, that's right, you got it, very good. <laughs> you just go, well, that's cool, all right. So it sounds like you feel like you're angry. What will happen over time is that tend to, if you don't make them have just a feeling, they're going to start reporting more complex feeling states, which is how it always was. Right? Uh, so interestingly, uh, emotional identification discrimination is easy except for the therapist who may want to set the client straight about their affect. But you know, there's something called funneling. Have you heard about this? It was originally developed in the domestic violence field, which is that uh, for men, we may funnel uh, sadness, helplessness, all kinds of things into anger, and women may funnel anger into sadness and crying, for example. These are just gender trends towards teaching each sex to have a slightly different way of expressing things. So for men, you have the manly strong affects, which would be primarily angry. And for women, what do we call angry women? We have a whole name for it, so, which we don't have the equivalent name for men, but an angry woman is a you-know-what. So obviously we have special messages to women about don't get pissed off, even though women have even more reason to be pissed off than men do on average when you look at their trauma history and the culture in which they find themselves. So it's going to be very interesting for people to try to, to, uh, to see if they can break out of the funnel. So if a woman's crying because she's angry, I'm not going to make a judgment about that. Maybe that's how she gets angry, but it's interesting. And it may be that I'm going to want to explore that in some way that isn't lecturing her about crying, but just trying to figure out what does crying mean for her, what is anger. And for the guy who feels inadequate, so screams at people. You know, he's funneling. So you can see that funneling could screw up. Uh, if you tell people what they're feeling, they could look angry, but they're really scared. 
You ever seen this? Sometimes I see them really macho, tough guys. I've worked a little bit with special forces in the Navy. I wasn't in the Navy, but I've had contracts with the Navy. A lot of those guys funnel everything into some version of anger. Well, so they look really pissed off, but they're not pissed off. They're sad. So if I tell them they're angry, I just reinforce where they You hear where I'm going here? So actually, this stuff about emotional identification is a little harder than it looks. Um, next one is sort of a favorite. Uh, resisting tension reduction behaviors. This is basically teaching people that when you want to cut on yourself, could you try to sit with the feeling without actually cutting on yourself? Allowing yourself to want to cut because emotional avoidance increases the likelihood you will cut. This is the pain paradox again. So feeling you want to cut on yourself can you just sit mindfully with the experience of wanting to cut on yourself without cutting on yourself? And I know that this is a little uh, hardcore, but what we say is uh, don't do it till you have to do it. When you do it, do it as little as possible for as short a period of time as you can. It's hardcore because it may mean that someone is going to cut on themselves anyway. But, you know, a lot of, <laughs> you know, how funny this will probably sound to you, a lot of people overdo self-injury. They cut way too deep. They actually could have just kind of minorly cut themselves and gotten the same effect. So if they discover that, A, they're not going to cut themselves so deeply. But why are we asking them to resist TRVs? Not by saying it's a bad thing, put it away, because that's shame-inducing, then they're going to avoid it, and they probably will do it. We want you to be present with your feeling but not act on it. It's equivalent to something we call urge surfing, the desire to take a drug or a drink, to sit with the feeling but not engage in the activity. These are called mindfulness activities, but they don't have to be seen that way. What's happening is it turns out that when we get triggered into wanting to do something, every second we cannot do it, more likely we won't have to do it. Because the activation that produces a TRB goes high and then drops. So every second you can go, you're moving down. So we ask you to just sit. But, you know, by the way, if I tell you don't cut on yourself, you will. So if I tell you don't cut on yourself, then I've driven therapy underground, right? Because now you can't tell me anymore. Now things are worse. But if I say, do the best you can. Don't do anything to yourself until you absolutely have to, and then do it as little as possible for as short a period of time as possible. You will always come to therapy with a success, because by definition, whatever period of time it was, that's the best that you could do. And what you do find is that some pe the longer you don't do stuff, you're actually teaching the client affect tolerance, right? The ability to sit with distress without actually acting on it. This is fun stuff. I'm sorry we don't have more time to talk about it. Usually in a two-day workshop, spend an hour or two hours on this very issue. Because it, ch it involves changing your relationship to your own urge, your own thought, your own desire to do something. Do you guys want to experiment with that? On the next break, how many of you don't think you should eat as many cookies as you, or pastries? So urge surfing or inter interrupting with a TRB, just go out there and stare at a brownie. Watch the desire to eat the brownie arise, but experiment with the possibility that just because you think you should eat a brownie doesn't mean you should eat a brownie. It's just a feeling you should eat a brownie. This is called metacognitive awareness in the mindfulness area. That's a different thing. Feeling like you should eat a brownie and needing to eat a brownie are two different things. So sit with the feeling. And what will actually happen, you'll probably eat the brownie, but if you don't, eventually you won't. Last week I was in Hong Kong. I don't know where. I was somewhere far away. And I did this whole thing and I came back. It was the most adorable thing. I came back to do the next part of the workshop. And sitting on my laptop is a big brownie. And the sign above it says, don't eat this. <laughs> okay, I'm well, hearing the end. We teach uh, mindfulness in a bunch of different ways here. Mindfulness is its own module. I would invite you to read about it. But you may know that right now in the psychological treatment literature, mindfulness is probably the most powerful modality we have. In meta-analyses, it's showing up as probably an independent source of symptom reduction and probably a more powerful one in many cases. So that's why you're seeing everybody, where people are using mindfulness for almost any psychological problem. That's not just people having a knee-jerk reaction to treatment du jour. It's actually true that mindfulness is helping in a wide variety of areas. We now know we can teach mindfulness to kids. In fact, Randy Semple, who you've seen, is a mindfulness specialist. She wrote a book on treating anxious children with mindfulness. We totally can teach adolescents how to meditate and how to develop mindfulness. We can teach their parents how to be mindful in their parenting of the child, and that stuff really does work. Will it work with every kid or every parent? No, but it's really worth uh, trying out. Of course, one of the problems here is that you yourself have to develop mindfulness, and that's not fun. Well, I mean, it is fun, but it's a precondition. So you can't just go, oh, mindfulness sounds like good. Here, let me try this when you've never meditated in your life. Cheryl's going to take you through the trigger grid. 
Uh, it's too bad this is the end of the workshop. This is the most popular model for kids. This is the thing they like the most because it doesn't sound very therapeutic at all. It's basically teaching them to identify when they've been triggered, both by knowing what the triggers are and knowing how they feel when they get triggered, and then problem solving with the therapist what they could do about being triggered, what could they do instead of what they would normally do. And there's various algorithms, including, for instance, cell phones. Uh, very interesting. Teaching people that when you want to do something, you could text a friend who knows that you'll text them when you need to do that thing. And sometimes just the texting will take away the need to do it. But a big, it's a very phenomenological issue here, which is that a lot of times our behavior, for us in this room, is triggered. We don't know that we're reacting based on early history that's causing us to behave in a way that we don't, because we make source attribution errors. We don't say, I'm sorry, Fred, you know what? You're probably a fairly benign person, but you're activating deep relational schema associated with early parental uh, indifference and narcissism. So this is engendering in me a reaction, which is not at all appropriate to the current context, but I actually want to kill you. But this is due to my own stuff. Don't take it personally. What we say is, you die, okay? Right, because we don't see that train of events. Adolescents are triggered all the time. So trigger identification intervention, now called trigger management because we want to try and sound fancier, is to help them work that through so that they, they can know they're going to be triggered and decide whether they want to be around to be triggered. If they inevitably will be triggered, that they can recognize it a trigger. This is in mindfulness called metacognitive awareness, the realization that you're having a thought, but it may not reflect what you think it's reflecting. It may be the past knocking on the door of your current experience. The minute you know you're being triggered, that probably changes how you're going to react. But if it doesn't, we also work with you about what could you say to yourself. And they're not brilliant things. One of the big things for adolescent males is, it's a, it sounds kind of macho when they say it, but I just like that they say it. They'll go, what they will say to themselves is, just walk away. Just walk away. <laughs> go ahead, just walk away. But do you see what it means? It means don't get involved in all this uh, comparing of penises, having fights, fighting over turf. Just walk away. Or you're with your partner and he or she is giving you a hard time. Just walk away. In other words, you don't have to sit with it. There'll be all these things. You, the reason you're wanting to fight with your partner is because you're triggered. So just walk away. By the way, if they're in a prison system, just walk away could get you killed. So you always have to check out all these things about how culturally appropriate it is, environmentally appropriate it is. So at the end of this, if you're lucky, you know when you're being triggered. And when you are, you then change what you're going to do next because it no longer is what you thought it was. And you have insight into that. And you have skills that you've developed about what you could do instead of what you uh, otherwise would do. We have family and caretaker intervention. Cheryl's going to talk to you about that specifically. Ideally, what we want to do is work with the parents to see if they can be better attachment figures. Uh, we, we sometimes help them with their own psychological difficulties, but you can imagine how complicated that is, and you may not have the resources to do that. Uh, we try to have them in parenting groups, and in the manual, you'll find that we have a whole chapter on modules for parenting groups, how to teach parents how to use non-punitive approaches to understand their children's behavior is due to abuse as opposed to badness. Uh, understanding your sexualized child is not a sex addict. They're a kid who's been sexually abused and prematurely sexualized, et cetera. And then a version of family therapy, just as there's feminist family therapy, uh, now there may be starting mindfulness-based family therapy. What this is is trauma-focused family therapy. And in trauma-focused family therapy, we're not actually trying to cure the family or fix the family, although that's a side effect sometimes. What we're trying to do is the same thing we're trying to do with parents. We're not trying to fix the parents of the family per se. We're trying to fix the parents and the family's relationship to the child so the child isn't tri triangulated, parentified, made into the identified patient, all those things you remember from school but instead that, that the environment is one that's going to allow the kid to grow more. So it's, it's, a, it's not pure regular family therapy. It's how can the family function better through working out relationships and stuff for the betterment of the child. The focus is always on the outcome for the adolescent. In fact, we literally work with some clinicians not to try to fix dynamics that aren't related to the child. It should always be, you know, how is this family focusing in terms of the kid? There's a lot of tools, though, and you're going to see everything from family timelines to all kinds of things we can do. I'm just going to show you that slide uh, and say that we generally uh, want to stabilize you and may make you be able to, you're not going to, we're not going to try to deal with your substance abuse issues until other issues are pretty much okay in terms of safety and the chaos of your environment. We're going to try to help you to understand why you substance abuse, but not in terms of making you take responsibility or accountability, but to understand that it's related to everything that's come up to this moment for you. Why some of the people in the treatment community fight me on this issue, I don't know. 
I guess, I guess it's an overblown view from my perspective of free will. They think that you, know, that you could stop if you wanted, but you're not. You need to take responsibility for the things you've done. Uh, I don't actually think that's true, and I hope I don't lose any of you in saying that. Uh, but I actually think that there's very little free will in these situations. So basically, what, although it might sound like a cop-out to another therapist, I want that kid to know the reason they're shooting up heroin is because of their lives. And that then gives us something to change as opposed to you're just a bad person, stop what you're doing. There's very little data that that works. Uh, remoralization comes from Lisa Najovitz, again, a wonderful woman. You should just check her out. You should read Seeking Safety. You should go to one of her workshops. She's a little hard to go to because she's so in demand. Remoralization is something we directly borrowed from her with her permission. This basically says a lot of kids are heavily involved in substance abuse, think they suck to the nth degree. They think there's nothing good about them. They're filled with self-hatred. They may not share that with you, but they're feeling that. Remoralization is working with them to see that they, even to this day, are doing things to help people. The time that they share their McDonald hamburger on the streets with someone they didn't hardly know. The time that they take care of this person or protected them from a bully if they're homeless or whatever. So we try to get, we don't try to talk them into things, we try to get them to find things so they can start to feel that they are a good person, they're not just an addict or whatever. Uh, just to give you an idea how hard it is, the problem that I write about extensively in the manual is the sharing drugs with your friend. You know? So that's remoralizing in the sense of, yeah, I'm good to my friends, I give them all the heroin that I don't use. So can you appreciate how hard that would be? Actually, I'm going to want you to say that is. I'm, remoralization focus. Yeah, isn't that sweet? You did that. The only problem is it has some serious downsides and you need to figure out what, what you think about that. But the idea is really pretty cool. Uh, we teach more affect regulation and we do less exposure, at least early on. Um, and then lastly, expect countertransference. There's no way you're not going to have issues with a substance abusing traumatized 16-year-old. First of all, they won't have the common courtesy to improve in your presence which is very irritating. Don't they know that's a major source of self-esteem? So they're going to be all difficult with you, and they're going to go up and down and stop and start. And you, know, you just have to take the, the bigger perspective, and we try to write about that some. Now, what does all this do? This is the last slide. What do you think? So blue is what they were at the beginning, and purple is what they were later. On 151 people, over 40% improvement. There was no control group, both because the funding group uh, didn't allow that. That was SAMHSA. And because the therapist didn't want to not give ITCT to kids just to see if ITCT would work with other kids. So um, take it as it will. But, but almost, we try to show in our study that if you, it, because I'm a statistician, I tried to calculate based on all the other studies we could find, what would be the maximum amount you would get better on your own anyway? Because that's what the control group's for, right? Well, actually, the amount isn't very big. If it was big, we wouldn't need you to be at this workshop, right? So I basically calculated the amount and then compared it to this, and the chi-square for the difference was very significant. So it's, it's a little bogus, but it's not deeply bogus. So what you see there is anxiety goes way down, depression goes a lot down, anger doesn't go down too much. And we found this in another treatment outcome study earlier. It takes a long time for anger to go down, probably six months on average. I think the average treatment here was three months. Um, Post-traumatic stress drops a lot, and that's neat. Dissociation, a little bit. Sexual concerns, a little bit. Dissociation, because if you're using an avoidance strategy, you're going to avoid treatment, right? <laughs> so treating an avoidance strategy is a problem. But it worked. And sexual concerns is probably the least responsive in two studies we've done now, just because sexual preoccupation, sexual fears, those things, pretty hard to do exposure therapy on that in the session, right? I mean, I don't want you to. So it's, it's harder work. It also uh, is much more intimately related to our views of ourselves. So when you work on that stuff. It's, it, it, you can make progress, we did, and it was significant at 0.001, but it, you can see it was a lot less than the others. Thank you very much. I've gotten multiple feedback from my colleagues that I went way over time, and I hope you forgive me for that. And I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.